Hi class. Okay, so it's our last lecture here in 315 and I hope you've enjoyed um, all of these lectures so far with me and this semester it was Dr. Laham. Um, next semester it'll be just me. But um, let's get into our final lecture on cancer, uh, which is very prevalent. It's still the second leading cause of death in the United States right now, right behind heart disease. And it affects all groups of people, women more so than men, by really just like a tad, according to the statistics currently. Um, and some of the most common cancers include lung, colon, breast, ovarian, and prostate. Um, so let's get into talking about cancer. We'll look at the agenda and the um, student learning objectives, and then we'll get right into it. So here's the agenda. We're going to do a quick overview, um, how to detect and prevent cancer, diagnosis, management, nursing management, complications, which are going to be really important. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about some blood cancers at the end. Here are our learning objectives, and um, this color thing is interesting. So anyway, um, so here's a link that shows the path of cancer. If you needed a review, I encourage you to click the link and watch this before continuing. Um, but just if you don't have to, then keep following along with me. Uh, so cancer is a disease process that begins when a cell is transformed by genetic mutations that are either inherited or acquired, and then it leads to this abnormal cell behavior, such as uncontrolled growth. And this continues and it will invade and infiltrate other cells around different parts of the body, which we then call metastasis. So here are some different classifications of cancer. Um, <clears throat> some terms I would encourage you to know. And here are some risk factors for cancer, and these can vary from genetics to lifestyle, environmental, or even hormonal. Um, some clinical manifestations. So some cancers have no early signs. Um, and then others will have very varying signs like um, that are not as, you know, it's not a huge red flag for some people, but um, people have unusual bleeding or discharge, they'll have changes in their bowel and bladder, maybe a sore that doesn't heal. Um, so sometimes it's subtle and people will not seek out help until um, later on in the stages of the cancer. Um, so knowing that some cancers have very vague symptoms and some have very specific symptoms, um, and these are just some examples. And then labs and diagnostics, it will largely, largely depend on the type of cancer, and so we'll always probably do some imaging labs and then biopsy to confirm. So the goals of testing are to obviously determine the presence and the extent of the tumor, um, identify any possible spread, so metastasis of the disease or invasion into other bodily tissues, um, and then evaluate the function of involved or uninvolved body systems and organs. Um, and then just to obtain, you know, cells like with biopsying for analysis. And then we can evaluate the um, stage and the grade of the tumor. So <clears throat> important history, obviously we get health history on everyone. Um, we determine risk factors and then we do a physical exam. So the provider the you as a nurse will inquire about um, those things and then you'll perform like a thorough head-to-toe assessment um, since cancer is really vast and it really can affect many different um, areas of our body and we'll get into that. So again, a diagnosis of cancer will be made through in-depth testing, looking at cytology of the cancer cells and whether those are differentiated, which means they look similar to the original cells where that cancer resides or undifferentiated, which means they look nothing like the original tissue and that's not a good sign. Um, 
So they would want to biopsy those cells and send them for evaluation. And the way that they can do this is by aspirating those cells through a needle biopsy. Maybe they will excise a mole or someone's skin or partially excise a piece of scalp or skin. Um, and we can run blood tests for blood cancers like leukemias. And we'll talk about that at the end of this lecture. Um, we can also use imaging such as x-rays, CTs, MRIs, and then PET scans. Um, in a PET scan, a small amount of radioactive glucose is injected into the vein and the PET scanner rotates around the body and it makes a picture of where the glucose is being used in the body. Um, malignant tumor cells show up brighter in the picture because they're more active and take up more glucose than normal cells do. Um, and then bone marrow aspiration can determine a diagnosis by looking at the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and platelets. So this is tumor grading, and I'm not going to test you on this, but I just wanted to include it. Um, so G1 is obviously well differentiated, so it's our best. Um, it's really a, a better sign because it resembles um, normal tissue, and it usually reproduces more slowly. Um, so those have a more favor favorable prognosis, whereas undif undifferentiated is worse. So here again is the tumor staging, um, and this really determines the size of the tumor and the existence of the met metastasis. Again, not going to be testing you on this, but it's just nice to know in case you ever want to dabble in oncology. So diagnosis of cancer in our role. So when a patient has a possible diagnosis of cancer, it's a really stressful time for the patient as well as the family. Um, and the patient may undergo several days to weeks of like actual diagnostic studies. Um, during this time, they um, have fear of the unknown maybe. Um, and it's a stressful, um, <clears throat> It, it can be more stressful to go through those diagnostic studies than the actual diagnosis of cancer. Um, but if you have an opportunity to be with a client when they're being told that they have a diagnosis of cancer, it's a very vulnerable and a difficult moment in someone's life. So just being there to actively listen to them, allow them to feel their emotions, restate facts about the diagnosis is really going to be the best thing that you can do as the nurse. So this is all about prevention. So we have primary prevention, which um, involves physical activity, changing your diet, maybe getting rid of risk factors. We have secondary prevention, which um, involves like screening, like pap smears, mammograms, colonoscopies. And then we have tertiary prevention, which um, is really treatment and mitigating the spread. So someone had already been diagnosed and treated, and now they're preventing any secondary cancers or malignancies from forming. Okay, so now on to medical surgical cancer treatments. <clears throat> it's gonna do this weird coloring thing again. Okay, so cancer treatment goals. Um, so when cure is the goal, treatment is offered that is expected to have the greatest chance of the disease eradication, um, and it may involve local therapy like surgery or radiation alone or in combination um, <clears throat> with or without periods of um, adjunct systemic therapy like chemotherapy or biologic and targeted therapies, and we'll talk about those um, coming up. Control is... Um, when the goal of the treatment plan um, is to um, make sure that the disease doesn't spread. Um, so we're trying to um, maintain the cancer where it is. Um, it's not curable, but we can try to control it from spreading. And then with palliation, um, we're really, our goal is to find relief or control symptoms um, for their quality of life. Um, rather than cure or control the disease process. Um, so with palliative treatment, there's an emphasis on minimizing treatment-related toxicity to the greatest extent possible. 
So <clears throat> an example of curative therapy would be with basal cell carcinoma of the skin, where we can go ahead and surgically remove the lesion um, and then do some radiation therapy and hopefully get everything so that that is now cured. Um, an example of control treatment is when someone has multiple myeloma and um, all we can do is try to control it from spreading. And then examples of palliation would, um, would be um, to maybe decrease, reduce the size of a tumor um, and try to relieve subsequent symptoms such as pain um, from something like bone metastasis. So here are the cancer treatment options that we're going to go into a little more depth about. We'll start with surgical treatment. So ideally, surgical treatment um, to remove the entire cancer remains the ideal and most frequently used treatment method. Sometimes it's not always possible, so they also use surgery for diagnosis, like biopsying or preventative. Sometimes women with um, the gene for breast cancer will go ahead and remove their breast tissue and the lymph nodes preventatively. They can then use like reconstructive surgery to rebuild that breast, breast tissue. Um, surgery can also be palliative where, like I said, we can go ahead and debulk a tumor that's causing pain or secondary issues. Um, so to summarize this, this slide, surgery can be used in a lot of different ways for cancer. And we've been talking throughout the semester about complications related to surgery, and it's really the same in this lecture on cancer. So watching for symptoms of infection, um, DVT, pneumonia, atelectasis, respiratory complications. Um, how can we as nurses prevent these and what interventions would you as a nurse perform if they had these complications? Just thinking about those things. So onto radiation therapy, and it can be external or internal. And I'm not gonna, um, so we're gonna be talking about radiation therapy, but I'm not gonna need you to know the specifics about like standard radiotherapy, proton beam therapy. Um, but radiation can be used in conjunction with other treatments such as chemotherapy, and it can be used to control or um, with palliative treatment. And about 60% of clients with cancer will receive radiation therapy at some point during their treatment. So internal radiation therapy is also known as brachytherapy. And this is the surgical implement, implantation um, or insertion of radioactive materials into or close to the tumor. Um, so it can be delivered systemically. And this is either given low dose or high dose. Um, and it's commonly used in combination with external radiation. Um, side effects include pain swelling in the tissue where it's been implanted, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, wet skin desquamation, which we'll talk about later on, um, and soft tissue injury, necrosis, which is um, a adverse reaction to long-term radiation therapy. So just educating the client to report any bleeding, any foul odors or drainage, fever, diarrhea, constipation, and increased pain. So if the client is getting brachytherapy, then they need to be on radiation precautions. And this entails keeping a distance from visitors, no vulnerable population visits from children or pregnant people, um, education on double flushing and hand washing, um, Healthcare providers should have a dosimeter badges and the charger should not be assigning any pregnant healthcare workers to a client receiving brachytherapy. Complications. So these are complications associated with brachytherapy, but also go along with some of the other treatments we'll be talking about. So alopecia, this is a disease that happens when the immune system attacks those hair follicles and it causes hair loss. Mucositis, this is when our mucous membranes are inflamed and painful. Bone marrow suppression can happen when we have anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia, which we call aplastic anemia. Uh, so not a great thing, and this can lead to fatal complications like hemorrhage and infection. 
And then we have moist desquamation and dry desquamation. So moist desquamation typically um, occurs after a cumulative, cumulative dose of radiation. And this is um, a result of destruction and sloughing of the dermal layers. And it's characterized by serous fluid drainage and it's really painful. <clears throat> And then we have dry desquamation, and it's really just like a bad sunburn from that external radiation therapy. So just knowing these complications and kind of what nursing interventions are going to go along with those. So now we'll talk about chemotherapy. So chemotherapy has evolved to become a therapeutic option that can offer cure for certain cancers. It can con control other cancers for long periods of time, and in some instances, it can offer palliative relief of symptoms when cure and control isn't possible. Um, chemotherapy doesn't differentiate healthy cells from malignant cells, um, so it destroys both. Um, but the goal um, is to really reduce the number of malignant cells um, at the tumor site. So here are those chemotherapy medications that we'll be talking about um, a little bit more in class. And I have listed some adverse reactions with them. Interferon, the one at the bottom we've talked about already. Um, tamoxifen kind of goes along with breast cancers. Um, the other ones are more significant for um, possibly uh, blood cancers or others, other types of cancers, but just kind of understanding the side effects that go with these medications. And Simple Nursing has a awesome chemotherapy medication video I think that you can get on YouTube for free. So um, chemotherapy can be given in um, a lot of different routes of administration. Um, major concerns associated with IV administration of chemotherapy include um, venous access difficulties or um, device catheter, like catheter related infections and especially extravasation, um, which is an infiltration of drugs into the tissue surrounding the infusion site. Um, it can also cause local tissue damage. These are um, chemotherapy is a vesicant, so it really does a number on our um, vasculature. So we want to be watching out for any signs and symptoms of extravasation, especially when we are giving chemotherapy IV. Chemotherapy complications. So it's extremely important to monitor for and promptly recognize symptoms associated with chemotherapy complications, um, like hypersensitivity reactions, toxicity, um, bone marrow suppression, and then, like I said, extravasation um, or possibly alopecia. So some other chemotherapy complications, um, this can do a number on our kidneys, um, our cardiopulmonary um, systems, reproductive neurologic, because like we said, a chemotherapy doesn't just affect those malignant cells, it can kill normal healthy cells as well. So it can affect systemically like our whole body systems. Um, so lots of complications to look out for. Um, so precautions for the client receiving chemotherapy. So during care of a client receiving chemotherapy, special precautions, chemotherapy precautions will be implemented. So we'll be double flushing bodily fluids. Um, they have special hampers for disposal of all of their um, like linens. Um, we as healthcare workers will be needing personal protective equipment, we'll be double double gloving, gowning, um, wearing long sleeves. Um, and then we have special concerns when it comes to chemotherapy spills um, and then really good hand washing. Um, patients receiving chemotherapy are at increased risk of infection. So we want to be making sure that if they are also on neutropenic precautions that we are not um, causing 
more of an infection risk for them. So onto hematopoietic um, stem cell transplantation, HSCT, and this is done to help eradicate malignant cells and it's used primarily for diseases of the bone marrow. So these clients already have bone marrow suppression um, and now we are going to give them, um, hopefully we'll give them back those um, stem cells so that they can um, increase their production of bone marrow. Um, so this procedure has a lot of risks. Um, it's highly toxic. Um, cure rates are still low, but they're increasing. Um, so we have different sources of cells, and I'll talk about those in the next slides coming up. So we can go ahead and harvest stem cells from um, donor bone marrow, um, and we usually do this through multiple aspirations. Um, as you can see, um, they're going in through the, the iliac crest to grab some um, stem cells. Um, and process them to deliver them to um, the client with bone marrow suppression. And then we can also do peripheral stem cell procurement. Um, and this is done um, from peripheral blood of a matching donor, as you can see in the picture. Um, this is an outpatient procedure. It takes about four to six hours. And this is where um, they, have a machine that separates the um, stem cells out from other cells and it returns that blood back to the donor. And then we can also do umbilical stem cell pr procurement, so stem cells from cord blood. Um, and this is different, um, usually done for pediatric patients. So I just wanted to bring this up, but I don't need you to know that for um, our adult health course. So hema, um, HSCT complications. Um, complications related to HSCT include acute toxicity, just like radiation or chemo, where we have nausea, diarrhea, mucositis, fever, chills, chest pain and just signs and symptoms of an infection, really. So until um, the engraftment of the new um, stem cells is um, occurring, these clients are at high risk of death from sepsis and bleeding. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, and then post-procedure, they're at risk of infection still from bacterial, viral, and fungal. Um, so sometimes we'll give them prophylactic antibiotic therapy, but we really need to be watching out for infection here. Um, and then also we need to look out for graft versus host. Um, sometimes our, their bodies might not um, like receiving um, stem cell uh, therapy like the transplant and their body might reject it. So we need to be looking out for that too. Okay, so now on to immunotherapy and targeted therapy. So this is going to block or interrupt uh, malignant cell growth, growth, cut off blood flow to the tumor, make cancer cells more receptive to the immune system. It can also cause cell death or target defects in the cancer cells. So um, we have different types of immunotherapy and this involves the use of medications or biochemical mediators to either stimulate or suppress components of the immune system in order to kill off cancer cells. So we have nonspecific immunotherapy, um, which does not target the cancer cell directly, but it rather boosts the immune system to enhance cancer cell destruction alone or it can be used along with other cancer treatments such as chemo or radiation. And um, Bacilli Calmet Guerin um, BCG, it's a live strain of Mycobacterium bovis, which is closely related to the bacterium that causes TB in people. And this is usually given to help treat bladder cancer. And some common side effects of BCG include mild flu-like symptoms, fever, chills, malaise, and then blood tinge urine typically um, after, like for two to three days. 
cytokines, we talked about interferon with neuro, and these are biochemical mediators, so they enhance or suppress the immune response. Um, and some adverse effects with these are going to be, again, flu-like symptoms, so fever, malaise, um, malaise, sorry, um, myalgia, nausea, and vomiting. And then monoclonal antibodies. Um, which we'll refer to as MOABs. These are fairly new with technological advances, and these target malignant cells without destroying normal cells. Um, adverse reactions with MOAB include, again, flu-like symptoms um, and allergic in infusion reactions as well. And then we have cancer vaccines, which help to mobilize the body's immune response to either prevent or treat cancer. And I've included some examples here. Okay, on to nursing care of the client with cancer. So what are our priorities? Well, we definitely wanna focus on preventing complications, managing pain, fatigue, self-care, um, activity tolerance, coping for sure, depression, nutrition, it can be all encompassing. Um, so this is why this is such a difficult subject or content area because cancer can literally affect everything. Um, so let's talk a little bit more in depth about the, these complications. So stomatitis or mucositis, it's inflammation of their mouth and mucous membranes. So what we want to do, we want to avoid glycerin swabs and alcohol containing mouthwashes like chlorhexidine um, and instead rinse with either normal saline, uh, baking soda and water, warm liquids um, like neutral liquids or other prescribed solutions that aren't going to burn the skin. And then we want to avoid any harsh foods like spicy foods. Um, you can use ice chips or popsicles um, and then consider a pureed diet when it's severe because obviously if they have stomatitis or mucositis, we're concerned with their nutrition status because they're probably not going to want to eat because it's too painful. So keeping that in mind. Um, and then Stomatitis and mucositis can also occur in the perineal or rectal area as well. So just thinking about that, um, maybe they need a peri bottle to help them um, have a bowel movement or use um, or um, urinate. So thinking about those things. So and then we have alopecia, which is a temporary or permanent thinning or complete uh, loss of hair. And, you know, before someone receives chemotherapy or radiation, we want to discuss their potential for hair loss and, um, and then regrowth with the client or the family, um, and then explore their, the impact it's going to have on their self-image. Um, we definitely want to prevent any trauma to the scalp, so encouraging them to wear um, head cloths, um, retain social contacts, um, and then explain to them that their hair growth usually begins again once the therapy is completed. Okay, on to dry desquamation again. So with that, we want to avoid the use of soaps, cosmetics, perfumes, powders, lotions, ointments. And Well, not all ointments, but we definitely want to be applying um, something like vitamin A and D or aquaphor over the area, um, using only lukewarm water to bathe because like I said, this is like a terrible sunburn. So we want them to avoid any rubbing or scratching of the area or shaving um, because we, we don't want to open that um, area of skin. It's very um, sensitive and vulnerable um, to infection. Avoid applying any hot water bottles or heating pads, exposure to sunlight or cold, um, avoid any tight clothing. And then we have wet desquamation. So what we don't want to do is disrupt any blisters that have formed. We want to report it to the healthcare provider. Um, avoid any frequent washing of the area unless it's actually being frequently soiled. Use prescribed creams or ointments. Um, if the area weeps, we want to apply a non-adhesive absorbent dressing. If the area is without draining, drainage, then we can use um, moisture or vapor permeable dressings like hydrocoil, wow, I can't say that, hydrocoil, 
Okay, I can't read it. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, we want to use like hydrogel um, dressings and consult with the provider if, um, you know, Escar starts to form or it starts to look um, worse. Um, altered nutrition, anorexia, cachexia, syndrome, nausea, and vomiting. Um, so what we want to do with this is we want to assess the patient's previous experiences with this. Um, maybe during, maybe this is done during chemo, um, and the expectations of nausea and vomiting, um, including the causes and what interventions we're going to be using. Um, we might want to adjust their diet before and after administration um, of chemotherapy. Um, and we definitely want to prevent any unpleasant sights or odors, sounds in the environment. We can use distraction like music, therapy, biofeedback, hypnosis, relaxation techniques, guided imagery before, during, or after chemo. Encourage them to eat, use pain control. Um, we can certainly give them antiemetics for their nausea. And, um, Again, we could pre-medicate them with antiemetics, maybe some sedatives, corticosteroids um, to decrease inflammation, um, ensure that they are hydrated throughout chemotherapy, um, monitoring their electrolytes, um, hemoglobin hematocrit, their I's and O's, daily weights. And severe cases, they might need um, TPN so we might have to insert a G or a J tube. And here are those fun antiemetic medications um, that will help control the nausea and the vomiting. Antidiarrheals because chemotherapy can cause diarrhea and obviously diarrhea can lead to loss of electrolytes and fluids. So we wanna push fluids and maybe incorporate electrolyte solutions. Pain, um, moderate to severe pain occurs in about approximately 50% of patients who are receiving active treatment for their cancer, um, and about 80 to 90% of patients with advanced cancer. So um, we want them to report pain and manage it. Um, Drug therapy obviously will be discussed. Um, Non-pharmacological measures to control pain can be added. Um, maybe the patient is fearful of addiction or maybe um, us as healthcare providers have a um, inclination that the client is starting to get addicted. Um, so we will, we will discuss that when that comes up um, and watch out for that. Um, but it's going to be individualized therapy for pain control. Um, we just want to be making sure that um, it is being well controlled. We are listening or believing what they say. Um, all of that. And there are different kinds of cancer pain. And you can look at these um, terms here. And they can also have activity intolerance and fatigue. So we want to determine the cause of that. Maybe it's nutrition or anemia. Um, we want to try to decrease the fatigue as much as possible by balancing their activity and rest, maybe using assistive devices, um, and then optimizing their sleep if we can. And then depression, coping, and grief. We want to allow our clients to verbalize their feelings, invent, answer any questions, give factual information, and offer support. Maybe we need to incorporate spiritual care or family support, therapy dogs, social services. And then again, monitoring and managing potential complications. So there's structural complications and metabolic complications, and we'll talk about a little, um, a little bit more about some of these. The biggest thing is going to be like risk for infection. So um, putting them on neutropenic precautions as needed and hopefully you all know what that means. Monitoring their white blood cell count, assessing for signs and symptoms of infection and along with that goes bleeding, um, educating the client on no raw or undercooked foods, no fresh flowers or fresh food, fruit, um, washing their hands um, really well. 
um, make sure they wash their toothbrush and dishes um, properly, avoiding sick people or crowds, regular oral care, no yard work or gardening, and then to report a fever over 100.3. We can give filgrastum for medications, which increases their neutrophil count and hopefully increase or decreases their risk for infection. I encourage you to look at that medication. And then we know that infection can lead to sepsis. So infection um, and sepsis is the primary cause of death in cancer patients. Um, here's some sites of infection that we could um, watch out for um, and why it occurs. Some factors that contribute to infection, which there are a lot of them when it comes to cancer. And then with sepsis, um, our goal is to prevent sepsis from occurring, especially um, in those who have um, severely um, destroyed immune systems. So we could use prophylactic antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals. We want to make sure that they are really uh, strictly hand washing. Um, we are washing their equipment and we're maintaining those neutropenia precautions. And um, it's really important to have early recognition and um, intervention of sepsis. And along with the risk for infection, they also have risk for bleeding. So we want to minimize needle sticks, blood draws. Um, we might have to apply prolonged pressure, or yeah, prolonged pressure when we do have to um, draw blood. Monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding. This is this includes stool, urine, and emesis. Uh, monitor their platelet counts. Good education about um, when they do have risks for bleeding, and then. Oprelvacin um, is a medication that helps to stimulate platelet production, um, but we definitely, if we're gonna give that medication, we wanna assess our heart rate and rhythm, um, ECG monitoring, um, so this has cardiac side effects, um, and we wanna assess their gait and coordination for safety. So I encourage you to look at that medication as well. And then with bleeding and hemorrhage, um, we, if they have thrombocytopenia, which is a decrease in their circulating platelet count, um, this is the most common cause of bleeding in clients with cancer. Um, we could see a petechial rash, which is tiny um, blood vessels um, just like starting to pop. So you'll see those on the skin. Um, so definitely want to make sure you're monitoring for bleeding and hemorrhage when if you see those on a, any client, um, not just cancer. <clears throat> and then we have risk for anemia. Um, so we want to monitor for signs and symptoms of deficient oxygenation and tissue perfusion. Um, we just talked about anemia in our last lecture, so hopefully this makes sense to you. Some medications that can um, help the anemia, ferrosulfate, so iron, make sure we're giving it with vitamin C for better absorption, uh, educating our clients that their stools will be black, and then we can also give epoin um, alpha, which is used to stimulate red blood cell production. Um, and some implications for that is to check blood pressures frequently, monitor their H and H levels and their iron levels. Um, another complication is superior vena cava syndrome, which is an obstructive emergency. And this is an obstruction of the superior vena cava by a tumor or a thrombosis. Clinical manifestations of this include facial or periorbital edema, distension of the veins of the head, neck, chest, and arms, dyspnea, cardiac output issues, because obviously if we're obstructing the vena cava, that's not a good thing. Um, it can also cause headache and even seizures. So our goals would be airway maintenance, symptom relief, we wanna treat the cause. So if that is because of a tumor, we could do radiation or chemo. Um, they might have to put in a stent or a CVC filter if that is caused by a thrombosis. Um, we wanna be giving oxygen, uh, maybe steroids to reduce the size of the tumor, diuretics, 
And then as nurses, we want to monitor symptom progression, administer meds, oxygen um, supplementation, managing their I's and O's, and then assessing their ABCs and neurostatus. And here's a picture of that superior vena cava syndrome and the clinical manifestations that go along with that. Um, so we also can have a complication of spinal cord compression, um, which is a tumor in the epidural space of the spinal cord. Um, some clinical manifestations of this can be intense localized persistent back pain, motor weakness, sensor, sensory paresthesia, and um, changes in bowel or bladder function or loss of bowel and bladder function. So um, as you can see in the picture, we see the tumor pressing down on the spinal cord. Um, so interventions, we would we might have to do radiation, steroids again to decrease the size of the tumor, hopefully, or surgery to debulk that tumor, activity limitation and pain management, and then um, we definitely want to be neuro checking because that's pressing down on our spinal cord. Um, so extravasation, I think this is the third time I'm talking about this. Anyway, um, so prevention of extravasation is essential. We want to be continuously monitoring the IV site if we're giving IV chemotherapy infusions. Um, if extravasation is suspected at all, we want to stop the IV infusion immediately. Um, and if possible, we could aspirate any remaining drug or blood from the tube. Um, we definitely want to be following instructions for giving the appropriate antidote. Um, for uh, chemotherapy if there is one. Um, then we might remove the catheter. Um, we can cover the area with a sterile occlusive dressing, apply a warm or cold compress depending on the extravasation um, and the type of drug. Um, we will rest and elevate the affected limb, but relay prevention is the best approach, so we want to be monitoring um, their IV site very carefully. As you can see in this picture, you don't want that to happen. And then another complication, I feel like I keep saying that, um, is hypercalcemia. So this results from secretion of parathyroid hormone like substance. Um, and this occurs most frequently with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, um, head and neck, cervical and esophageal cancers, lymphomas and leukemias. So they'll have hypercalcemia. Um, and we talked about hypercalcemia um, and what we can do about that. So hopefully this is just a review for you. And so the treatment of hypercalcemia um, is treated with aggressive hydration, diuretic administration like furosemide, um, bisphosphonates like alendronate, calcitonin, um, or in severe cases, hemodialysis. So with hypercalcemia, we really want to maximize safety, minimize constipation if we can, analgesics for bone pain. Um, uh, dis we don't want to be giving any multivit multivitamins or antacids because those have calcium in them. Um, we want to maintain their level of mobility if we can, monitor their cardiac output and neurostatus, eyes and O's, daily weights, and education. And then we have tumor lysis syndrome, and this is often associated with tumors that have a high growth rate and are sensitive to the effects of chemotherapy. Um, so this is potentially very fatal. Um, so with hematologic cancers and lymphomas, um, which have a large tumor burden or, or large tumor burden cancers, um, we can give chemotherapy and um, the tumor starts to um, rapidly um, lysis, so it destroys the tumor uh, very rapidly, and so we have these hallmark signs um, that may persist for five to seven days. So we'll have hyperuricemia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperkalemia, and hypocalcemia. So that's not good. Um, so clinical manifestations will be neuromuscular signs of hypocalcemia. Cardiovascular, like we'll have arrhythmias, bradycardia, and it can lead to VTAC, VFib, and arrest. So that's why it's very um, 
urgent that we recognize the signs of tumor lysis syndrome. Um, it can also destroy our kidneys, so we want to be um, making sure that we keep someone out of acute renal failure. So the prevention in doing that is by giving someone adequate IV hydration 24 to 48 hours before chemo begins. Um, so like three to six liters a day. Um, because once chemo starts, it's too late to impact the effects of um, tumor lysis syndrome. We can't hydrate them. Um, if tumor lysis syndrome occurs, the goal of the treatment is to protect our kidneys and electrolyte imbalances. Um, so increasing urine production with hydration, like IV fluids, and decreasing those uric acid concentrations. Um, something that we can give is allopurinol like when we talked about gout. So if we have increased uric acid, we can give allopurinol. And in severe cases, we can um, dial, um, do dialysis. Um, some providers use sodium bicarb, and this is to raise the pH, um, but we don't see this as, as um, often because evidence suggests it's not effective. So nursing interventions, we definitely want to maximize safety because um, they'll be on seizure precautions. Maintain adequate fluids, diet restriction, strict I's and O's. We want to assess their urine pH. Um, it's really all about correcting those imbalances of electrolytes with a tumor lysis syndrome. All right, so we're going to end this lecture by talking about hematologic cancers, which is in chapter 30 in your book versus chapter 12, which we just discussed on onco um, oncology. So with hematologic cancers, the mechanism um, for which normal white blood cells are made in hematopoiesis is altered in some way. So hematological cancers are classified by the specific blood cell involved, and we'll talk about that in the next slides. But something, um, um, sometimes these blood cells overcrowd bone marrow because they grow so quickly and just take over it because, um, and because of this, it can affect other organs such as lymph nodes, spleen, skin, etc. And we'll talk about that. So let's start with leukemia, which is a cancer of the bone marrow, and it's categorized in two different ways, acute and chronic. And leukemia is a cancer of the bone marrow where we see leukocytosis or an increase in leukocytes or white blood cells. And this is normal for someone who has an infection, right? But with leukemia, leukocytosis, it's persistent, prolonged, or it's progressively increasing despite treatment. Um, so the cause of this isn't fully understood yet, but exposure to chemo, radiation, certain genetic disorders, and viral infections are known to be risk factors for certain types of leukemias. And leukemias are classified according to the stem cell um, which they affect, so either myeloid or lymphocytic. In acute leukemia, the onset of symptoms is abrupt and death can occur within weeks to months without aggressive treatment. And in chronic leukemia, symptoms evolve over a period of time, like months to years, so it's slower progressing and the disease trajectory can extend for years. So here are common symptoms of leukemia. So remember that um, overcrowding of the bone marrow and it can result in neutropenia. So we can have fever, frequent infections, swelling of the lymph nodes, it can also result in anemia. Um, so symptoms of pallor, fatigue, weakness, dyspnea on exertion, dizziness. And then with the proliferation of leukocytes within organs like the liver and spleen, it can lead to enlargement and pain. Um, bone pain as well. This is lympha lymphanad why can't I say anything today? Um, lymphadenopathy, which is enlargement of the lymph nodes. And as you can see, um, the lymph nodes are enlarged under this client's armpits. And it's painless. So what diagnostics are we going to look at um, when it comes to leukemia? Well, leukocytes, of course, so those white blood cells, the white blood cell count itself can be low, normal, or high, depending on where the client is in the disease process, but the percentage of normal cells um, is usually vastly decreased. So they'll look at um, CBC, and they'll look for anemia and thrombocytopenia. 
um, and then a bone marrow biopsy is usually done and will take an excess of blast cells, which is a hallmark of leukemia. So here are your nursing priorities, and these are based on labs like anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, and what interventions you might perform based on those labs. So the overall goal of treatment is really to achieve complete remission of the disease in which no residual leukemic cells in the bone marrow or the peripheral blood occur. And in order to do this, chemo is administered in two parts, so induction and con consolidation. And this is based on the client's age and physical status. So induction really usually involves high volumes of chemo where all cells are being destroyed because remember that chemo kills normal cells as well as malignant cells. So watching out for infection and bleeding is going to be your highest priorities here. Okay, on to lymphoma, and this is a type of cancer usually starts in the lymph nodes, but it can involve lymphoid tissue in the spleen, GI tract, liver, and bone marrow. And there's two types, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And Hodg Hodgkin's is rarer than non-Hodgkin's, um, and with both the cause is really poorly understood. So let's start with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, the hallmark of this cancer is the appearance of those Reed Sternberg cells, which look like little owl eyes. And they have two nucleuses. Um, and this is what providers will look at when they're diagnosing Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, the prognosis with this um, lymphoma is good. Uh, clinical manifestations will see that lymphonado, uh, lymphadenopathy Thank you. Uh, liver and spleen enlargement, maybe a mediastinal mass um, might be seen on chest x-ray and it may con compress the trachea and cause dyspnea. But all organs are vulnerable to the invasion by tumor cells. So clinical manifestations of the compression of those um, kind of rear their ugly head like jaundice, abdominal pain, pulmonary effusion, uh, treatment is really determined by the stage of the disease process, and it may include chemo, radiation, or both. So just keeping in mind the systemic effects of that treatment, like myelosuppression, nausea, alopecia, infection risk. And with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we see an unpredictable spread of the um, so an unpredictable spread and in infiltration with malignant cells into the lymphoid tissue. So the incidence increases with age and the prognosis depends on the type and stage and clinical manifestations and treatment are similar to Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, this type is just more concerning because of that unpredictable spread of malignant cells. And finally, multiple myeloma. It's a cancer of the plasma cells in the bone marrow and it destroys the bones. So more specifically, these destroy B lymphocytes, which we know are helpful in producing immunoglobulins that help us fight infection. So that's a clue onto what kind of priorities we'll be um, thinking about with this type of cancer. And the etiology is unknown, but risk factors like old age have been identified. And if this cancer is left untreated, it really just destroys the bones and it lends to bone marrow failure. Um, clinical manifestations have a lot to do with this, as you can see. Uh, classic clinical manifestations are referred to as the crab features because they refer to hypercalcemia, renal dysfunction, anemia, and bone destruction. And treatment includes chemo, corticosteroids to reduce inflammation, radiation, bisphosphonates like alendronate, remember we, that puts the calcium back into the bones, and possibly a bone marrow transplant. And that was it for our cancer content. Um, it was a lot, so if anything, any part was confusing to you, I encourage you to look at your book or um, you can always email me um, or when we have class, we can talk about it. Okay, have a great day.